Hello and welcome to INSS podcast series. The maritime border demarcation agreement between Israel and Lebanon, what each side achieves from the agreement and how it is expected to affect the future of relations between Israel and <coughs> Lebanon and in particular the relationship between Israel and Hezbollah against the background of Nasrallah's threats against Israel, the launch of the drones toward Karish Gaz and other threats that were made during the weeks of negotiations. In this podcast, we will discuss these topics and some other aspects of the agreement and its impact with two of our experts, Orna Mizrahi, a senior research fellow and a former senior member of the National Security Council, and Yoram Schweitzer, the head of the Terrorism and Low Intensity Conflict Program at the Institute. Hello, welcome both. Hi. Hello. So first we'd like to make an overall evaluation and um, mm-hmm. <clears throat> first I would like to ask you, uh, Orna, after over a decade of negotiations, uh, what are the factors that contributed to the signing of the agreement at the current time? Okay, I think that both sides uh, recognize that there is a very a narrow window of opportunity that they have to, uh, to use it in order to have this agreement and it's because the coming election in Israel and of course uh, uh, the end of the term of the president on in Lebanon but before that I think that the main change was in the Lebanese uh, attitude and, and position uh, and it started at June and uh, at, at the beginning of, of June when the uh, Karish region arrived to the Israeli territorial, territorial uh, water the uh, Lebanese side understood that they are going to lose the opportunity to have something with Israel about that. And after a dec- uh, 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 few years that they were insisting about what they want to get and they, they uh, 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 draw a new line that was, had no reason, they uh, withdraw and came back and, uh, and uh, presented a, comp- uh, a, a compromise uh, a suggestion to Hochstein. They call him, uh, call it, called him to uh, Beirut and presented this uh, uh, um, position, new position. And I think that this was the starter for what we are uh, seeing uh, uh, now. So it, it's, it's the uh, timeline, it's the change in the Lebanese attitude. I think it's also uh, the, the change of the approach of the, mm-hmm. the new mediator. He, he tried to, to see how both sides are going to gain for the, for the situation, who can get what, etc. And I can't ignore, of course, uh, Hezbollah's threats. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, we will yeah. discuss it uh, in a minute. I just want to make uh, another point with you. So, as I understand from you, basically the breakthrough uh, was actually achieved <coughs> by compromise, right? Between both sides. By compromise, but I, I would say that Israel's w- uh, willingness to compromise uh, was well known, but the big change was on the Lebanese side. Sure. And uh, I think that it's quite obvious that it has started from there. Sure. Yoram, um, so Orna already mentioned Hezbollah, and we do know that this is like the, the big elephant in the room. Uh, during the negotiations, Nasrallah made his own remarks, including precise threats against Israel, uh, sending the uh, drones toward the Karish uh, gas field, and uh, the notion that there might be a confrontation at the end of the tunnel. So what is the opinion of Hezbollah on the matter? Uh, does the agreement meet its expectations and the demands that Nasrallah made during the uh, speeches? Yes, first of all we have to remember that Hezbollah was, a direct, uh, not, was not directly involved in this uh, negotiation. He mentioned it in his speeches, Nasrallah, that he is sitting above in the bench of the spectator, the guardian, that there is no deviation or serious deviation from what is agreed upon between Hezbollah and his government. So I think Nasala had to swallow some bitter frogs in this process. Eventually, at the agreement when and if, probably when, it will be signed. Uh, I think on the most important for him, uh, the elements that were important for him, he can be satisfied because the main one was the cognitive warfare. This is where his 
main achievement was, uh, and towards the inner uh, Lebanese uh, population. Vis-a-vis sure. uh, -vis Israel, I think it maintained this equation of deterrence that he wanted to maintain, and uh, maybe later we'll talk about the, the frogs, the bitter frogs we that I mentioned. We'll discuss uh, the cognitive campaign, the kinetic campaign, and of course, how does this affect or has, has any impact on the uh, uh, deterrence between Israel and Hezbollah. But just a quick more question that probably bothered most Israelis during uh, the period of uh, negotiations. Uh, can this agreement actually prevent escalation of the military conflict between Israel and Hezbollah? on both the short and long term? On the short term, it definitely uh, will prevent escalation that was hovering around this uh, conflict. Uh, in future, there will be more uh, confrontations on the border, on the ground border, and maybe even in the maritime border, although if everything goes smoothly, there are no reasons for Hezbollah to provoke Israel on the maritime space and about the incentives of the organizations and how it actually became involved in the process, we will hear from you in the next uh, part of our podcast. So I'll come back to you, Orna, getting into the details. So what is the content of the agreement? How does it actually work? Okay, it's exchange of letters between the U.S. and the parties because the Lebanese didn't want it to be direct uh, negotiation between, uh, uh, with Israel, of course, because of uh, Hezbollah. Uh, and uh, it includes two main uh, uh, issues. The first one is marking the, the border, the maritime border between Israel and Lebanon, and the second one is about producing the gas. So about the, uh, uh, marking the uh, maritime uh, border, of course there was a compromise, and was a very big compromise, uh, more than before, on the Israeli side. The <coughs> what is written in the agreement is that they are marking a permanent and equitable uh, uh, boundary. So it's, this is very important for Israel, that it's permanent uh, a boundary, but it goes along the line of, uh, of the, the <coughs> compromise that uh, Lebanon was suggesting, the, what we call the 23 line. Uh, and it means that most of the disputed area, 860 uh, square kilometer, is going uh, to be on the Lebanese side. But um, Israel uh, 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 got what uh, was very important for Israelis for security reasons. It's the first five kilometer adjacent to the shore, the closed five kilometer uh, close to the shore that Israel was uh, demanding and was very stubborn about that, that it will stay as it is today. And in the agreement, they say that the, st the current status that status quo at this five kilometer is going to be as it is uh, today. But it's very interesting that in one of the articles of the agreement, it says that even about this, it's going to be the permanent, the, the perma permanent boundary between two countries. And this is uh, quite an achievement for the Israeli side. But I say there is a big compromise about the, the, uh, the disputed area, that most of it is going to uh, Lebanon. Uh, uh, but most of it is <coughs> in the uh, um, uh, uh, is easy. It's economic uh, waters and not territorial waters. The territorial waters it's only five point point eight square kilometer, not so much, and this is w the reason why it could be approved by the government and not by uh, by the Knesset. Uh, at last. So this is about the boundary. The second one is about the uh, the production of the gas. Mm -hmm. And here, nothing is written about Karish because, for sure, Karish is Israeli gas field. It's and outside, it's the, outside the disputed it, area. It, it doesn't have nothing to do with the agreement, and Israel could continue and produce whenever uh, uh, they could f for uh, uh, and decide for their own reason when and why. So this is nothing about Karish. About the potential. Uh, gas uh, uh, field, uh, Lebanese gas field, what we call Tzidon in Israel, they call Kana. Uh, it's only potential. Uh, uh, what was decided is that all the rights of this gas field are going to be for Lebanon, but Israel will get compensations for that, for its part. Mm -hmm. 
Um, there is no, uh, there is nothing about the scope of the compensation in the agreement, but the number that, that was uh, presented was 70%. It's less, more or less than what Israel was ready to get uh, before. So this is another Israeli compromise. Uh, and anyway, it's going to be agreed between Israel and the, and the uh, consortium in total uh, that is going to uh, research and produce the, the guys over there uh, and with no nothing to do with the Lebanese. It's going to be and, uh, and they're going to start immediately the uh, negotiations and have some uh, a decision about how and when Israel will get uh, these uh, compensations. And uh, as we know, uh, a part of the details of uh, how the mechanism of the uh, agreement works, the United States play the crucial role yeah. in bringing the sites into this agreement and uh, does it have any role in the agreement itself as uh, yeah, it's, someone it's got, who yeah. is responsible for the yeah, yeah, implementation? Yeah. It's, it's got a very central role in the agreement itself, not just by mediating to get it, but also in the implementation and uh, the U.S. is also uh, is going to be part of the negotiation between the, uh, both sides if there will be future uh, disputed over there uh, in the future. It's written in the it's written in the uh, agreement. So uh, uh, actually, Lebanon gets uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, recognize U.S. as the one that is uh, mediating and uh, have a very central role. And I think this is uh, an accomplishment for Israel and. Uh, I, I'm not sure that Hezbollah li likes it so much. Another, uh, the last one, l last uh, issue is about the relationship between both cr countries. Nothing is mentioned in the in the agreement about that. Of course, Israel would like it to be uh, a, a kind of improvement or change in the relations. Nothing in the agreement, uh, but of course, it has its its implication because there is a change in the relation between the. Sure, and, and you'll have the opportunity to and elaborate to, that yeah, yeah. in the next uh, part of the uh, podcast. Let's go back to Hezbollah, Yoram, to the beginning of the story with the kinetic campaign, sending uh, drones toward uh, Karish uh, gas field in July. What can we understand from that campaign? I think that it's obvious that it is a combined campaign, kinetic, which was degraded kinetic component and increased and enhanced uh, cognitive campaign. Now, Hezbollah used an unarmed UAVs, I emphasize unarmed UAVs, in order to give uh, credentials, to give uh, uh, support, backing, to the cognitive campaign. I think Hezbollah was not interested in escalating the situation in spite of its verbal aggressive rhetoric. Uh, it used the kinetic just to back up the main component of the campaign. It serves, it launched twice non-armed UAVs in order to raise the attention of Israel. In the first one, Israel didn't react. It didn't even notice it. So then, after giving a very aggressive speech, he enhanced the speech with three unarmed UAVs that he launched towards Israel in order to get, to finally get Israeli ten, uh, attention. What was the purpose of the uh, requirement for attention? Nasrallah knew exactly that in mid-September, or sometimes in September, Israel will start pumping the gas without any achievement for Lebanon. He wanted to get Israeli attention to the needs of Lebanon and the main demand of Nasrallah was that Israel will not pump the gas until the Lebanese interest within the potential agreement will be met. And this is how he enhanced or influenced the enhancement of this negotiation between Israel and Lebanon. So the kinetic side was marginal and degraded because it didn't launch any uh, harm, uh, harming uh, UAVs, right? So this was the, this kinetic part. The second kinetic part was a potential one, like a saw that is hovering around the heads of the Israelis. He threatened to use his arsenal, which he had built 
for a long time with the, with the assistance of Iran. If Israel is not going to get into negotiation and to a final agreement between Lebanon and Israel. And in this sense, it's a classical campaign that Nasrallah was in this part successful in presenting it at, at, as his achievement. We'll later on discuss so, whether he achieved anything or not. So uh, that's the point that I wanted to ask you uh, more uh, broadly about. If we look at the l big picture, how does this serve Hezbollah as an actor within Lebanon in the conflict with Israel and also as part of the Iranian uh, Shiite axis in the region? Okay, let's talk about Lebanon. I think that the Lebanese public opinion, the Lebanese politics was the main goal of Hezbollah. Now, Hezbollah is still a very serious pivotal player in the Lebanese politics, but the coalition, the chunk that Hezbollah led before the last elections was much stronger. It still has a position, a strong position, but it was weakened. And Hezbollah, uh, Nasrallah, who is criticized vehemently in Lebanon in a more aggressive way, uh, wanted to, to meet the main two criticizing factors. One, that Hezbollah is not a patriotic Lebanese player. He is serving more the Iranian interests rather than the Lebanese one. The second one was the uh, accusation of Hezbollah holding its weapon as an exclusive weapon within the Lebanese politics and determining the questions of war and, and peace. And I think that this campaign was intended to diffuse, to defunct these two critics, critics or critical uh, 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 criticism against him in Lebanon. In this respect, he can now present himself as one who is a patriotic Lebanese patriotic who defended Lebanon with his exclusive arms. And this is by uh, weakening the uh, claims against him. I think this was the main purpose of this uh, campaign. The second one was because he hitchhiked on a very serious and critical issue of the Lebanese crisis, the economic one. And he knew that he had a consensus of support in Lebanon towards this uh, attempt to achieve Lebanon rights economic rights, although it's potential because it only can be produced in five to seven year, uh, years. So I think he dwelled on this issue because he could have gotten a, an immediate achievement. And he knew it. This is why he threatened to use kinetic means, although he stated that he doesn't want, he didn't want any war, but he was ready for it. I think this was the logic of the campaign. But on the other hand, as an actor that is close to Iran, that re receives uh, money and arms from Iran, how does it reflect on Hezbollah? Again, I think, I think that all in all, Nasrallah may have a, a tactical achievement, but a strategic loss. On the other hand, Israel had given up concessions, as Orna described it wonderfully, but Israel, for the first time, I think, usually we have kinetic victories, but strategically we don't know how to translate it. In this case, Israel translated this campaign, gave Nasrallah a, a space of, of sense of achievements, maybe some points to have a propaganda campaign with it, but on the strategic level, Israel gained. Now, when Iran looks at it, I think it understands it. Now, for the Shiite axis, or rather the resistance axis, mm -hmm. uh, axis which includes also uh, Palestinian Islamic Jihad and, 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 and Hamas, for them, these ver verbal achievements and verbal bravado and sometimes backing, uh, is getting backing by Israeli uh, pronouncement from political purposes or some experts that think differently than us, for, for the axis, it will be used to strengthen their sense of and conviction of empowerment. That's, I think, how they look at it. And we will go back to you for the uh, conclusion of this discussion about Israel, Hezbollah, and the deterrence between both. So, Orna, we actually reached the end of our discussion. I, I would like to ask you to uh, summarize the uh, gains and uh, the losses of uh, Israel and Lebanon in this agreement. Who gained, who lost, 
Um, and at the same time, um, how does this agreement meet the basic needs and interests of both sides? I totally think that it's a win-win agreement. It's agreement that has mm -hmm. benefits for both sides on uh, many aspects. Uh, Lebanon mainly uh, gained on the economic uh, level and uh, it's important what she got for the, uh, the for the first time the, the opportunity to start the research and the production and being part mm -hmm. of this um, uh, East Middle East uh, forum of, uh, of uh, countries that export uh, gas maybe or and have gas uh, for the f uh, f at the first it's going to be We ha it's not immediate. It's going to happen uh, a few years. Uh, uh, we have to wait for that. But I think that the stability that we are achieving uh, here in the, in the region is going to attract uh, a more uh, investment in, uh, in Lebanon maybe and maybe uh, more help to Lebanon. So I think on the economic uh, uh, level, Uh, th uh, there is gain for Lebanon, Israel has its profit from uh, not so much from uh, uh, the new uh, uh, potential uh, gas field if they are going to be production, but uh, it's, it's uh, not zero, it's something that we wouldn't have anyway. Now on the, uh, on the security level, I think that both sides uh, uh, benefit from it because uh, we are going to have more uh, uh, stability, more uh, secure, secured uh, opp uh, opportunity to uh, develop the, the gas uh, in Karish and in, uh, in the other places and also uh, the Lebanese uh, uh, as well. And I hope, uh, we can't be sure about it, that at least It, uh, it uh, uh, delays uh, the, the next uh, conflict, uh, wide-scale conflict with, uh, with Hezbollah. We'll, uh, sure. Yoram will talk about it uh, later. But I think that most of the benefits for Israel are on the strategic le uh, level. And Yoram has already uh, 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 said something about it. I think that uh, first it's about Israel, and uh, I hinted about it uh, before, about Israel and Lebanon relations. I think it's, I don't know if it's historic, uh, the history will judge, but mm -hmm. I, th I think that it's a, a fundamental change in the relation between the two countries that had wars all over the, on, uh, the last decades, uh, hostile relations, etc. I think that it, it brings some hope on both sides, it's very important, and it, it depends how we are going to use it and how it's going to uh, Uh, to develop in the future, but it's, it's a change that we have to look at it, and uh, I think it's important. The second one is, uh, I'm not sure that Hezbollah and Iran liked so much that we have an agreement with Lebanon under the mediation and the uh, auspicious of, uh, of uh, the great Saturn of uh, US. I'm sure that uh, Iran doesn't uh, like it. Hezbollah had no choice but to, to agree, uh, agree to that. Um, and it, it disconnect, uh, it not it, uh, uh, let's say, uh, um, uh, prevent uh, Iran from having a stronger foothold uh, in Lebanon as Hezbollah would like it to be. Hezbollah always tries to connect Lebanon to the Shiite axis and to have economic relations with Iran, Syria, etc. Uh, but now what this agreement brings us is a, a better mm -hmm. connection with the West, uh, relation, economic relations with the West. So I, I, don't like, I, I don't think that the Iranians are going to like it uh, as much. Yoram, does this agreement help keeping the balance of deterrence between Israel and Hezbollah or, on the contrary, actually encourages Hezbollah to do more provocations against Israel in the future, which might eventually lead to a military confrontation? I think what is important to say is that it didn't change the balance of mutual deterrence. Some people in Israel are afraid that it's going to increase the appetite of Hezbollah for more confrontation. I think Hezbollah has enough it, uh, appetite to have frictions with Israel not to escalate it towards war. I don't think that Hezbollah and Nasrallah wants a war. By the way, he said it. Even in this case, which was very, the, was, uh, very uh, f full of tension, uh, I think that it may 
have an impact on the psychology and the self-confidence of Hezbollah, of Nasrallah in his false uh, pretensions to be uh, uh, with the, uh, the equal, equal uh, uh, um, power of both sides. I don't think it's the same. I think Israel could have allowed itself to be generous mm -hmm. on one hand in order to gain some strategic achievements. I think we are going probably to see more frictions between Israel and Hezbollah because it serves Hezbollah. It serves Hezbollah to maintain its position in Lebanon okay. it, in order to, uh, to defend Lebanon or to present himself as a defender for Lebanon. So I don't think it ends the, the potential confrontation for future. However, I don't think it changed anything in the power. I think it's a little bit over-exaggerated. Indeed, sometimes Hezbollah is over-evaluating its capabilities. It may encourage him to do so, to go, to go on the brinkmanship like he did uh, in this episode. But I don't think all in, uh, overall, I don't think it changed anything. So that's it. Thank you very much, Orna and Yoram. Thank and you. we will continue to discuss this very important issue as others in our English podcast series. Thank you very much for watching and listening. Mm -hmm.